when a murder is left unsolved. No weapons, no eyewitnesses, no forensic evidence at all. There was nothing. And a killer is on the loose. These people are still out there. Who's going to be next? Britain's cold case detectives will never give up. The best way to solve a cold case is to keep it warm. No matter how long it takes. This case dominated my life. They'll investigate every angle and follow every hunch. Searching through thousands of people. They think they got away with it. You haven't. Until justice is finally done. We all leave a trace. We finally identified that golden nugget. Bingo, we've got them. It was the early hours of the 25th of February, 1994, when 21-year-old Jason Comerford was stabbed in the neck after a night out in Manchester city centre. A very distressed female called the emergency services. She could see a man lying down in the road. He was bleeding heavily and she thought he was going to die. By the time the ambulance arrived, he was dead. Detective Chief Inspector Martin Bottomley knew this was no ordinary incident. In 1994, murder was a rare occurrence and a stranger murder was exceptionally rare. The types of crimes that would have been committed on a lively evening in Manchester in 94 would have been domestic assaults, the odd fight outside a pub or a club, just angry young men or men who had too much to drink at the time get into trouble. Kevin Moore was a detective constable on Greater Manchester's force at the time of the attack. Jason Comerford was a, a young man who was single. He lived alone in his own flat in the back end of Ancoats. And on the night of being killed, he'd gone out into Manchester city centre to meet up with colleagues from his works at Discotheque Royale. He worked for a textile firm. He was also an amateur artist. He was the fourth child of five, and he was ordinary kid, just out socialising. He asked his brother if he wanted to go with him. His brother didn't really want to go out that night, but Jason did. He was a very sociable man. So he went to a number of bars and clubs and ended up going to the chip shop afterwards, buying some chips and walking along Great Anko Street. And at one point, he went into the alleyway on George Lee Street, which is where the fatal attack took place. When officers reached the scene, they made a gruesome discovery. We were left with a series of spots and pools of blood which showed where Jason had staggered from the point where he was stabbed across a major road junction to collapse in the road. Following the trail of blood, police pinpointed where the attack had started. A search of the scene close to where Jason had been stabbed was made and officers soon found a knife. It was bloodstained. A 10-inch knife was recovered by detectives. It looked like police had their murder weapon. That knife was very distinctive. It had the words Hunter on it. It was a lock knife that had been folded back so the blade had been put back inside the handle and it had just been dropped on the ground. The knife was photographed and immediately sent for forensic examination as investigators pieced together Jason's final moments. The officers at the scene immediately got the sense that this was a random, unmotivated attack by a stranger on a stranger. There was no reason for this attack to have taken place. It was senseless. Most acts of violence of this severe nature take place between a known offender and a victim, but random killings of this type do occur. It may be that somebody bumps into somebody else and has an altercation and it escalates into very serious violence as a result. The pathologist report did not suggest a fight that had got out of hand. It was much more chilling. A Home Office registered pathologist conducted a post-mortem examination and established that Jason had died from a single stab wound to the neck. <laughs> 
but there was a crucial witness. Before the fatal encounter, Jason had met someone on his way home. The female witness who dialed 999 had been spotted with the victim. She was very distressed, she was shocked, and she was in a confused state. And what she was telling the police at that time probably made it a bit more difficult to establish exactly what had happened. She spoke to the police officers at the scene where she had gave the account that she'd met him, the victim, Jason. So they treated her as a vulnerable witness. Despite her muddled state, this female witness was able to offer the police something valuable. What the witness did do, though, was give us a description of the killer. The distinguishing features of the killer was that he was a white male, slim build. He was in his late 40s or early 50s, had long gray hair. He was carrying a bag. The other witnesses on Great Ancoat Street were a taxi driver and a lorry driver, and they were also able to give a description of the killer or the man they'd seen running away from Jason, who was now lying fatally wounded. They described him as about five foot nine, and also, crucially, carrying a, a black hold all over his shoulder. They said he was a scruffy appearance and wearing a dark overcoat as well. Armed with eyewitness descriptions, police immediately scoured the area. Within hours, they had a breakthrough. Police found a suspect, and he was sleeping rough nearby. And his description matched that given by the female witness and the two male witnesses who had seen Jason dying in the road. And that suspect was a man who had come to Manchester from Liverpool that night. He was seen around uh, the streets of Manchester in the same area as Jason, visiting some of the same clubs and pubs as Jason, and had eventually got drunk and fallen asleep in a doorway near Piccadilly train station, where he was found about two hours after Jason was actually stabbed and ultimately arrested. Had investigators caught a lucky break and found Jason's killer? Manchester, February 1994. Witnesses to the fatal stabbing of Jason Comerford had quickly led police to a suspect. He fitted a description broadly of the offender that had been seen running away, and he was thoroughly interviewed. He was put on identification parade so that the people who had seen the offender run away to see if they could identify him as that man. But none of the witnesses could confirm that he was the man they'd seen leaving the crime scene. He was later released without charge when he was eliminated. The police's best lead had come to nothing, and other potential suspects proved equally frustrating. The suspects had alibis and didn't match the description. They were quickly eliminated, and the team came to a dead end. Now, back at square one, Greater Manchester Police combed through Jason's last known movements, hoping for a clue. Investigators did a CCTV trawl to try to establish where Jason had been in the hours before his murder. Of course, in 1994, Manchester City Centre didn't have many CCTV cameras as it does now. The images that were obtained were low quality and grainy and didn't exactly show as much as we might have wanted. All we had was a view of Jason entering the original nightclub he'd gone into that night. It showed what he was wearing, what he looked like, and how he walked in. And that was just as he went past the doorman, as part of a group of people in a line going in. And images from the streets outside were even less conclusive. The investigation team looked at all possible CCTV in the area, but came up with nothing that covered where the offence actually occurred, or the likely routes that the offender had taken to the scene or away from the scene. CCTV proved another dead end in the search for Jason's killer. So detectives turned their attention to the only physical evidence they had. The knife was examined and processed using conventional blood grouping tests and also SLP, or single locus probe, DNA profiling tests, which showed that the blood on the blade matched Jason Comerford. Everything that was done with that knife confirmed it as the murder weapon. 
but we got nowhere as regards trying to find fingerprints, dismantling the knife to see if we could see fingerprints uh, or other evidence within the, the handled construction of it. Apart from the blood on the knife, no other evidential material was recovered at that time. They may have had the murder weapon, but forensic scientists could not find any trace of who had used the knife to stab Jason, so it was forensically archived. The investigation had hit a brick wall. Everybody involved in this case was incredibly frustrated and disappointed. And of course, there was still the threat of a, a stranger on the loose going around Manchester, attacking people randomly, and that was the greatest threat at that time. When Jason Comerford was killed in such a fashion, it shocked the city centre and beyond, really, because of the nature of the way in which he died. It was motiveless, it was a stranger, it was just chilling, really. By May 1994, three months on from Jason's murder, all leads had dried up. So Greater Manchester Police put out an appeal on the BBC's Crime Watch, hoping it would be the push needed for a witness to come forward. Jason Comerford was 21 when he was killed this year in Manchester. He lived alone and worked locally at a textile company. At around 2.45 a.m. on Friday the 25th of February, Jason was stabbed near the corner of George Leeds Street and Great Ancoat Street. A short time earlier, he was seen talking to a man near the Daily Express building. If that was you, please come forward. The knife used in the attack is distinctive. It has a black Teflon-coated blade with the words, The Hunter, printed on the handle. We'd like to talk to anyone in the Manchester area who recognises it. Hopes were raised by one caller who responded. The Crime Watch appeal did apparently trigger a phone call to police with a name of someone who was regarded as either a prime suspect or their name was given as the killer. But as the name given was very common, investigators could not identify who the caller was talking about. We tried to get back to that caller and trace them, but we could never do it. Despite the media appeals, the lack of forensic evidence turned the case stone cold. Unfortunately, at that time, there were no real suspects who could be attributed to be Jason's murderer. For nearly 16 years after Jason was brutally killed, nothing moved on the case. Until 2010, when Martin Bottomley, now head of Greater Manchester Police's Cold Case Unit, decided to reopen the files. We will always try our very best to bring justice to the victim and the family. So we wanted to take a fresh look at it and there were some new forensic techniques available. Forensic techniques had advanced since 1994, but re-examining the archive materials taken from Jason's murder scene was not straightforward. You've always got to be aware that there may be something more sensitive coming in the future whether it be DNA techniques or examination techniques. So you've not to use all that retained material because in a lot of cases, once that material has been used, we can't then go back and re-examine it. 16 years on, the DNA forensic breakthrough Martin was hoping for was still just out of reach. What Sue said in 2010 was that if you wait two or three years, with the advances that I can see are coming on stream, we can probably get a good result for you on, on that occasion. So her advice was, don't do too much with these swabs now. Let's, let's leave it a bit. Let's try again in a couple of years. The risk of destroying crucial forensic evidence before science caught up was too great. All Martin's team could do was to sit tight. We had to put the case on the back burner. Cold case work is very slow, very methodical and takes a lot of time, and it's very detailed. But we just had to wait. Sadly, for some of Jason Comerford's family, it proved too long a wait. Many members of his family died. Jason's relatives, including his mum, dad, brother, didn't get to see the outcome. Not learning why Jason was killed, or by whom, compounded the suffering for the Comerford family. It may have prevented them from going through the conventional stages of grief, 
and is likely to have significant negative consequences for a long time. Martin was determined to get Jason's remaining family some closure, but without anything substantial enough to revive the case, the hunt for Jason's killer hit another brick wall. Five more years passed with the case still unsolved until forensic scientist Sue Cherry's earlier prediction finally came good. In 2015, a new DNA technique became available, which we refer to as DNA 17, which looks at further areas of DNA, but also has the added advantage that the technique itself is more sensitive than previous DNA techniques. DNA 17 meant accurate DNA profiling could be carried out on microscopic samples collected from the crime scene for the very first time, including the archived samples from the most crucial piece of evidence, the murder weapon. Part of the forensics team since 1994, Sue Cherry returned to help crack the case. In 2016, the decision was made to revisit the material that had been retained at the forensic archive in relation to the knife, small pieces of fabric, which had been used in 1994 to sample blood staining and cellular material from the knife blade and from inside the handle of the knife and to attempt DNA profiling on some very small samples. The minute size of these forensic samples was no longer an obstacle for Sue and her team. The techniques available enabled us to yield DNA profiles from very small amounts of material. So we could obtain DNA still from blood, saliva, and also very small amounts of cellular material that might have been transferred, in this case, we presume, from the handler of the knife. This fresh analysis of the carefully preserved samples opened up a whole new avenue for the detectives. We obtained a mixture of DNA, a major profile which matched the deceased. I was also able to resolve the profile of a second lower level contributor of DNA. It wasn't a complete profile, but what it did allow us to do under DNA 17 was to load the profile onto the DNA database and that came up with a list of 19 potential persons who could be associated to having handled the knife. Martin Bottomley and the cold case review team could then apply other search criteria such as location and age to sift that information and decide if any particular person of interest could be identified. 19 potential matches was a daunting starting point for Martin, but one name quickly drew his attention. Only two people lived in the area near where Jason was stabbed, and of those two, one person in particular stood out like a sore thumb because of a number of his convictions related to knife crime and offensive weapons. So he was a prime candidate for us to look at really closely. That person was Jeffrey Strike. After more than 20 years of disappointing dead ends, Martin finally had a prime suspect. Investigators now did a full background check on Jeffrey Strike. Jeffrey Strike fit the description of the offender, so we had to look at his criminal history, what we knew about him. Did he live near the area of the offence? Did they know each other? The more police looked into Strike, the more disturbing the picture became. Jeffrey Strike had a long history of criminal offences. He had 16 convictions for possession of offensive weapons, mainly knives, but on one occasion he'd attacked police officers with a samurai sword. He didn't injure them, fortunately, but he damaged the police car they were in. Quite chillingly, in October 1996, when he was arrested for one of his offences of possession of a blade, he threatened a police officer and said, F you, you little bee, or I'll cut your throat. There were 
a large number of convictions between 1994 and 1997, and in particular five offences in 1994, within half a mile radius of the murder scene. Geoffrey Strike's dangerous convictions placed him in central Manchester in the 90s, but police didn't stop there. We were able to establish that he lived within approximately 400 yards to the scene of the murder. He lived in the direction that the offender had walked away from after stabbing Jason and dropped the knife. The address he kept on giving the police was Victoria Square in Manchester, one of the flats there, and it was an acquaintance's flat. So he was, in essence, sofa servant. Detectives were desperate to track down Strike. They first tried the lady who'd owned the flat back in 1994. Unfortunately, she had passed away, so we couldn't go to her. We went on to do house-to-house -house inquiries in that location to see if there was any residents who went back that far in time and could remember him or remember the people who lived there at that time. They had aged, so that came up uh, unsuccessful as such. Jeffrey Strike seemed to have vanished and police were running out of leads until cold case officers made a startling discovery. Jeffrey Strike was in a uh, psychiatric unit uh, within a uh, Manchester hospital and had been for two decades. Twenty-four years after the brutal murder of young Jason Comerford in central Manchester, huge advancements in DNA profiling had finally given cold case detectives a prime suspect. Now 73 years old, Geoffrey Strike was a man with an extensive history of mental health issues and criminal convictions. After attacking a police officer with a samurai sword and damaging the police vehicle, he was sentenced for six months. While he was serving that sentence, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and he was transferred to a mental health unit in Greater Manchester. There are various forms of schizophrenia. So those who suffer may experience delusions, hallucinations, they may hear voices, they may have paranoid beliefs, and they may suffer from a general mismatch between their mindset and reality. In rare instances, this may escalate into very serious violence. Strike's last known address and history of knife crime made him a prime suspect as Jason's killer. But the evidence was circumstantial. Martin needed hard proof. Whilst Geoffrey Strike was on the list of 19 persons identified from the DNA database, that in itself did not tell us precisely that his profile matched the killer's profile. The only reference profile available from Jeffrey Strike only examined six areas of DNA, whereas the DNA test that I had performed looked at 17 areas of DNA. So I requested a further reference sample from Mr Strike so that I could compare a complete reference DNA profile from him to the DNA results that I'd obtained previously. With permission from Strike's psychiatrist, Martin's team paid him a visit at the mental health unit. What we're asking you today is to provide a DNA sample. So you're happy to provide a DNA sample for us? Yeah. You just want me to open your mouth for me? That's it. Fill in. That's yeah. perfect. That's something you happy with his capacity yes. Yes. to have made that yes. decision himself. Perfect. Strike's new DNA sample was submitted for analysis. It gave us the answer we were looking for. It was a match. This forensic match showed decisively Strike had handled the knife used to murder Jason. Martin's cold case had been revived. In June 2018, Martin's team conducted an official interview with Jeffrey Strike in the presence of a lawyer and welfare support. We're investigating the murder. It was in the early hours of the 25th of February, 1994 where a young lad by the name of Jason Comerford was stabbed on George Lee Street. It was a single stab wound to the neck, and sadly, the young man died that night from his injury. With regards to that incident, Geoffrey, are you responsible 
for no that comment. stabbing. No comment. I'm not in it. No comment. Do you remember where you were around that time, 25th of February? No comment. Do you recollect ever being involved with a fight or a scuffle with anybody? Fallout? No comment. He made no comment to most questions put to him during his interview. Probing for any detail, detectives questioned Strike about the 10 inch knife. What I'm going to show you, Jeffrey, is I'm going to show you a picture. Now, this isn't the actual knife that was used, but it's exactly the same model. And it's got written on it, as you can see, the hunter. Yeah? Mm. Do you recognise that knife at all? No. No comment at the end, but I don't recognise it. You don't recognise it? No. Right, OK. Even when confronted with the key evidence, Strike's reaction remained the same. That knife was recovered at the scene on the morning of the murder, OK? And that has been subject to a lot of forensic examination, Jeffrey. A DNA sample was gained from it, and ultimately, your DNA was profiled to this knife. It's not my knife in the first place. I've never seen it before. Right. It's impossible for it to have my DNA on it. This I've is... never used that kind of a knife. He denied ever seeing or possessing or touching the knife, not simply saying, I can't, couldn't remember, he denied it. Since a person diagnosed with schizophrenia is likely to be suffering a mismatch between their mind and reality, things that they say have to be approached with caution and they may be unreliable. But the scientific evidence was indisputable. The scientist is happy to state that, in her opinion, as a result of that DNA profile, you have handled that knife. I'm not coming. So, so, I'm so, not. The, so the question arises, Geoffrey, is that why is your DNA on that knife? I'm not coming. We have at this moment in time a knife that we know forensically has been used to kill Jason Comerford, and your DNA is on that knife. Hmm. Have you anything to say with regards to that? No, I'm not coming. He denied all knowledge of the murder at that point. Strike also made his feelings clear about the cold case investigation being brought to his door. Is there anything that you wish to add, Geoffrey, at all, before we finish this interview today? Only that I'm 73 years old and I'm a war veteran. And I don't see why I should be interrupted after all this length of time. And I've been in hospital 21 years. I don't see why I should have all this trouble. The evidence that Strike had handled the murder weapon was solid, but DNA data alone would not be enough. Martin needed more to build a watertight case if he wanted to get Strike convicted. We had the match, but there's still a heck of a lot of work to do so that we'd eventually be able to present a, a case file to the CPS to allow them to authorise a charge against Jeffrey Strike for Jason's murder, and we still had a long way to go. Now an investigation officer in the major incident unit, Kevin Moore assisted Martin's team with preparing their case. We had to review the initial murder investigation from then 24 years earlier, put a case together, and also at the same time investigate Jeffrey Strike. You needed that type of corroboration to support the contention that he was the offender and take it forward. Detectives' first task was to prove any other suspects who'd come up in 1994 had been successfully discounted. I had to highlight and explain how other suspects had been eliminated from that uh, initial investigation. Some of that was people who were on the run, who'd been escaped from prison and um, had been in the area. Others were people giving us a name as the offender who actually was in prison at the time of the offence. That then showed the investigation had been done properly and thoroughly, and it took away any argument from uh, uh, a defence point of view that we'd got the wrong man. This process meant detectives had to revisit their very first suspect, the one they'd arrested on the night of Jason's murder. We had to go back to interview him and uh, get evidence off him about what he'd done on that night 
to say, I didn't do this and I was looked at by the police wrongly. I was just on a night out and became the worse for wear from alcohol and ended up falling asleep in, uh, on the streets of Manchester. We went back to him and explained that the man who had actually killed Jason had now been identified and was being prosecuted. The sense of relief that this man showed was incredible. He was just so relieved, explaining he'd lived with this, this fear for 24 years that the police would still come back to him because he knew how strongly he was suspected at the time as the killer. As well as initial suspects, the original witnesses from 1994 also had to be tracked down. The key witnesses in this case were a taxi driver who was passing the scene at the time of Jason staggering out into the street, two men in a truck on the way to work, and a lady who had been with Jason. We interviewed this lady who made the original 999 call, who'd met up with Jason. And there were many other witnesses we had to trace and interview as well. Without the evidence they provided, we wouldn't have had that supporting evidence to take the case forward. Their eyewitness accounts were key to this prosecution. The corroborating evidence against Strike was stacking up, but Martin and Kevin knew which piece should deliver a conviction. The key piece of evidence in this case was always the knife. Having the murder weapon found at the scene, it's like manna from heaven. You don't get it in many cases. And to then have that murder weapon fully identifiable as the weapon used to kill Jason, with his blood and DNA on it, the offender's blood and DNA within that knife to show that he'd handled it, was just key evidence. It was evident from the very start that forensics would be the key to opening this investigation, taking it forward and leading it to a conclusion. It was absolutely critical. Martin and Kevin's teams diligently built a comprehensive case against Strike. We had the DNA evidence, we had the previous convictions which were highly convincing in terms of Strike's ability to carry out this type of crime. We had the contextual information in terms of the witnesses at the scene describing Strike and his backpack. I was convinced that this case was extremely strong and would proceed very smoothly through the CPS to the court in a short space of time. In November 2018, my unit submitted the prosecution file to the CPS for a charging decision. A few months later, the Crown Prosecution Service gave their verdict on the submission. That was rejected in February of 2019, saying there was no case uh, to proceed with on legal grounds. Unbelievably, the CPS in the North West said no, not enough evidence. So, as is their right, Greater Manchester Police appealed. Again, that appeal was turned down. We went higher. It went through to the hierarchy of Greater Manchester Police, going to the highest level that the police could uh, appeal the decision. We took it to an assistant chief constable who also appealed the CPS decision. That appeal was also turned down. It was a series of devastating blows for Martin and Kevin. The CPS even questioned their key exhibit. I was convinced we had more than enough evidence to take this case to court, but the CPS were concerned that a knife is a movable object and someone else other than the killer could have touched it. I appreciate the CPS uh, think about these things in a different way to investigators, but it was incredibly frustrating and I could not understand the approach they were taking at that time. I felt quite incensed by that decision because you just don't get the kind of evidence we had in this case when you think it was an innocent man, 21 years old, going home attacked by a stranger for no reason in the street in the middle of the night, a horrendous act of violence, and to not be willing to give a chance of prosecution of that case, I found just a really, really bad and wrong decision. <laughs>
25 years on from Jason's murder. Martin and Kevin were so close to a conviction. I knew that police had exhausted all the options, but I also knew about the victim's right to review. The right to review scheme allows victims and families to request a review where a decision not to proceed with a criminal case has been made. So we spoke to Jason's brother and asked him if he would like to appeal that decision as well. It helped that Darren Comerford was a qualified lawyer. He knew the circumstances of the case. He knew the strength of the evidence. He has a legal mind himself. So he knew where this should go. Darren Comerford, as the family representative, submitted that appeal, and that was the final appeal process. Decades of investigation and the pursuit of justice now depended on this one last review. The case was transferred to an independent QC in London, and in very short order, the decision came back. A quarter of a century after Jason Comerford was murdered, detectives' attempts to charge his alleged killer, Jeffrey Strike, had been repeatedly knocked back. The fate of the case now hung on a last-ditch appeal made by Jason's brother, Darren. Chief Inspector Martin Bottomley anxiously awaited the decision. When Darren appealed to the CPS, the decision came back that Jeffrey Strike should be charged with murder. That decision was critical, it was crucial, and it was the right decision. I think there was surprise and shock, really, in Manchester that um, finally there'd been a breakthrough. I felt impressed by what the police had achieved. I felt pleased for the family, because when we broke the story, saying that Geoffrey Strike, who was 75 at the time, had been charged, there was quite a reaction online, in including members of Jason's family, who were expressing their relief that finally they might see justice. After formally charging Jeffrey Strike with murder, detectives were granted full access to his medical records to help prepare the case for trial. His psychiatric medical notes dated back to the 60s. That involved us reviewing over 80,000 pages of medical notes and accounts, both physical paper and I think it was something like 18,000 pages of digital records. Investigating officer Kevin Moore was staggered by what they found. We found in those records three occasions that after he was interviewed for the murder in 2018, that he had actually spoken about the murder to three people within the psychiatric profession. In those conversations, he freely admitted his involvement in the killing, claiming to have been acting in self-defense but crucially, he admitted the incident had occurred and that he had actually killed the man. That became further corroboration to our case, so we obtained statements from those three medical staff. Strike speaking out about his crime came as no surprise to Martin. Everyone involved in the investigation was satisfied at this point. Uh, the case was going to move forward to Crown Court, but with the overwhelming evidence, we always suspected that Jeffrey Strike would eventually admit his offence. The deep dive into Strike's medical records also revealed more disturbing information. Incredibly, Jeffrey Strike was due to be released from the mental health unit in November 2019, as he was deemed no longer a threat to the public. It was cold case officers' hard work that had quickly changed that evaluation. Jeffrey Strike was deemed to pose a moderate risk of harm to self or to others, and he was housed at a medium security psychiatric unit. But when he became a suspect in the murder investigation, he was transferred to a high security psychiatric unit. Strike's extensive medical records offered no clue why he had killed Jason Comerford, but they did give a fuller picture of Jeffrey's state of mind 25 years earlier. Those mental health notes showed that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia before 1994. He'd come out of prison 
and when he returned to prison in 1996, he was still suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. But there was no treatment, there was no medication that had been provided to him within that time. He'd not magically become well, and therefore, in 1994, he'd clearly been a paranoid schizophrenic. Jeffrey Strike's murder trial was scheduled for December 2020. In the months leading up, a full review of his psychiatric history was undertaken. That led to the correct view that in 1994, when he committed this act of uh, violence, he was suffering from uh, paranoid schizophrenia. It was agreed by all professionals involved, the Crown Prosecution Service, the forensic psychiatrist, the defence psychiatrist, that the most appropriate outcome to the trial would be that Geoffrey Strike should plead guilty to manslaughter. Geoffrey Strike was able to claim that it wasn't murder, it was manslaughter due to diminished responsibility, due to his psychiatric illness. And ultimately that's what he pleaded guilty to in December of 2020 at Manchester Crown Court. The manslaughter plea took Strike's schizophrenia into account but the court still had to decide an appropriate sentence. The ruling came almost 27 years after Geoffrey Strike took Jason Comerford's life. After a Manchester Crown Court hearing, Geoffrey Strike was sentenced to an indefinite hospital order and the judge commented that he may never be released at all. An indefinite hospital order is the equivalent of a prison life sentence but in a secure unit setting. Given his age, he's unlikely to ever be released. The court finally delivered the justice that Martin and Kevin's teams had fought so hard for and Jason's surviving family deserved. Darren has shouldered a lot of this for many years. He's had the burden of missing his, his brother every single day. He visits his grave regularly, where his mum and dad also lie at peace. He actually missed the final words of the judge when Strike was sentenced. He left the courtroom early to lay flowers at Jason's grave before darkness set in. But he now knows he's, he's got justice for all his family. It's one of the few times I think I've actually seen full closure for the bereaved family members. The brother, Darren, on the day of sentencing, for this case. In my view, there was true closure for him. The police investigation and prosecution brought that closure. This was the right result, but it took far too long for Jason and his family to get justice. Convicting a killer after nearly 30 years didn't go unnoticed across the city of Manchester. There was genuine surprise that after so long, the police had not given up and had got a result. The fact that they were successful in this gives hope to many families in Greater Manchester whose lives have been overshadowed by tragedy and unanswered questions and tells them that there still is a possibility that that darkness might be lifted one day. Jason Comerford's murder case spanned almost three decades but detectives' perseverance paid off. It's a case that Martin and Kevin will never forget. This was a very unique case because of its age, the ups and downs, but we got there in the end. It's a job well done. This case is an exceptional one, really, because the perpetrator, Jeffrey Strike, killed Jason randomly, completely unmotivated attack, and it was, went unresolved for so long. If somebody is brought to justice 20, 30, even 40 years later, it's a fantastic feeling and that's a great result.